one. And it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. And it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything right. that occurred in the Rendlesham Park. I know just what's going on doesn't here. involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. A... It comes right Replay. over our heads. It's so... Uh, classic flies. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. Looks like I got a little bit of editing to do for the uh, podcast. Uh, sorry about that. So um, we had a couple of windows open here, and that's what happened. Um, this is Martin Willis. Welcome to Podcast UFO, and I'm uh, live streaming on YouTube all the way from uh, Russia. And uh, my guest today is going to be Stanton Friedman, and we're going to be talking about well, uh, the UFO documents on Midnight in the Desert. I want to get his take on that. Um, also, uh, Alejandro Rojas is coming up here in just a minute. We're going to be talking about, uh, he was at Roswell last week, and so was Stan Friedman. So Stan and I will be talking about that. I'm sure Alejandro will be discussing that as well. If you support the show, I want to thank you very much. And uh, that's pretty easy to do at a couple dollars or more per month. Um, I was checking today. Boy, we're getting we get a lot of downloads on our free show, which is great. Um, I finally got it so I can see statistically how many are uh, being downloaded. So uh, uh, yeah, if uh, you want to spend a couple dollars or a month or more, you can do that on podcastufo.com. If you can't do that, but you still want to listen to the whole show, all you got to do is tune in live on YouTube or on podcastufo.com and also, um, the time is 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to um, get on a mailing list on the sidebar on podcastufo.com, there is a little email sign-up. You just pop your email address in there, and you'll get a notice for when the shows are coming up uh, once a week, and it'll also state the time it's and all that. And when the uh, Everything Else show starts again, that notice will be included in that as well. I think that's enough talking for me. Alejandro, how are you? I am well, my friend. Yes, and you've, uh, you've been, uh, wow, you were in Roswell, and you've been busy. That is right, my friend. Yes, I was in Roswell for the 70th anniversary uh, shindig. Uh, of course, I've been out there for the last, uh, uh, during the event. 20 years or, or no not that long 10 years or so um but yeah this was a lot of fun this was bigger than uh previously although it's continuing to to do really well and this being the 70th 70th a lot more people had shown up so we had like a lot of people from arizona in fact arizona mufon had a float in the parade so that was a lot of fun and the parade actually was a lot bigger there were several floats so KGRA, uh, Race Hobbs, you know, runs that, yeah, uh -huh. the uh, station that has a bunch of podcasts. They were they had a float, and they were also sponsoring and helping organize the Daily Roswell Records event. And the Daisy, Daily Roswell Record also had its own float. So this is fun. I got to be on that float with uh, Nick Pope, Chase Kletsky, or no, I'm sorry, not Nick. Uh, it was Richard Dolan. Nick was there speaking. He wasn't on the float. But Richard Dolan, his fiance uh, Tracy, uh, Chase Kletsky, myself, David Marler, um, and his girlfriend and her girls, and then Josh Gates. So from the TV show, What Expedition Unknown? Oh, okay. He was on our float, too. So that was kind of a lot of fun. I, I posted <laughs> some pictures uh, of that. So... Yeah, that was a good time, and as far as the talks, you know, lots of great, interesting stuff. No groundbreaking uh, or even new piece of information, I don't think, was relayed. Mostly people uh, at our event at the, for the newspaper were talking about uh, Roswell itself, which was kind of a challenge for some of us because we're not experts on Roswell, but of course, we are familiar with Roswell, so we talked uh, about that. I talked about some potential... 
um, evidence that you know some things that need to be analyzed that hopefully I'm, I'm a project of that will uh, get those things analyzed but also some of the recent new news that uh, discussed Roswell such as the document that you're going to be talking to Stanton Friedman about and also another uh, alleged witness who has come forth um, and that was in Irina Scott's book so I've interviewed her not too long ago but she's got a new book out called uh, UFOs, 70 Years of Lies, Misinformation, and Government Cover-Ups. She is a PhD, actually, and she's been in ufology for decades mm -hmm. uh, as in MUFON and stuff like that. So this book is kind of all about her research, including, yeah, the testimony of some guy who says he was part of uh, or had, had seen some stuff. So I can go over the details in that story, too, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's hear about that. Okay, so this is interesting. This guy says he was a police officer, a deputy sheriff, in fact, in Big Springs, Texas. And he, in the 40s, says they were going to pick up a witness in Roswell. He was riding with his sheriff. Well, along the way, they said they saw some commotion near Roswell off the side of the road, so they parked and right off the road. So they said they were within 12 feet of these gurneys with bodies on them that the wind blew and he could see under the gurneys and there were aliens under there. Uh, he said they're like five feet tall, big heads, big eyes, like like we know. Um, and then off in the distance, they had like a crane that was picking up some large uh, 100 foot in diameter uh, circular object that seemed to, to have crashed in the desert there and uh, they were collecting all of this. So. They looked at it for a while. The military guys told them they couldn't get any closer, and eventually they left and went and picked up their prisoner. So that's his story. There yeah. are a couple issues. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask you about a, an issue that I was thinking. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what's yours? Mine is when you have an object that's 100 feet across, first of all, there's no other mention of anything like that. There's the small, like, volkswagen size thing mentioned at the uh, second site or whatever. You heard that a number of times. Um, and you only hear scattered debris on the, the first site. Uh, and then secondly, how on earth would you transport a hundred, um, you know, circular, hundred foot object anywhere? Um, you know, mm -hmm. that just can't be done or it can't be done easily or, uh, you know, covertly in any type of way. Yeah, so those are all great points. Yeah, there's a, a, a lot of obvious, I think, glaring issues. Also, none of the crash sites were right off the road where mm. people could see them. Um, the military, he says, because uh, the witness, uh, you can see the testimony, um, he, he says the military didn't bother him, didn't tell him, hey, don't tell anybody about this or get out of here and, or anything like that. So, um, which is kind of funny. They just, you know, let them look. And, and they had these bodies, you know, 10 feet away from the road where these guys came and, and parked. So that doesn't fit uh, the location. There's also another problem. So Chase Kletsky was part of this where Irina um, and Philip Mantle, who published the book and also wrote the story that you can read about this on Open Minds, went to MUFON and said, hey, what do you guys think? Can you help us do some research? Well, uh, some of the MUFON guys did some research, and they found that the guy that he says was sheriff that he went with was sheriff in the 30s. Then he uh, lost his uh, sheriff duties. You know, someone else was elected. And then he regained, uh, he w ran for sheriff again and regained that position in the 50s. But in the 40s, this guy wasn't sheriff. So they suspect perhaps this guy is not necessarily lying, but he saw something else. Maybe he saw something else that had crashed in the 50s when he and the sheriff were driving uh, near Roswell. So, yeah, so there's a lot of problems with this gentleman's testimony. Yeah. But uh, it's something that else has kind of made some news because, of course, uh, UK tabloids have picked up on the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, of course they have. <laughs> And I, and and roll with it, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, um, that is interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. It doesn't sound it doesn't sound really that good, and it's 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 too bad. And I was wondering, um, you know, I was going to talk to uh, Stan about Stan. this. If there's a lot of people that 
have shown up over the years at the festival that were purported witnesses. Do you happen to know that? I do, because almost every year, you know, there's some hub and some secrecy. Uh, you know, did you hear about this guy? Or, you know, I talked to this guy or that guy. And so that that sort of thing does happen. Um, in fact, I heard of someone that uh, supposedly was talking to people at this event as well. So I'm not sure of any of the details, and a lot of times these things don't pan out, but sometimes they do. So we'll see. And mm -hmm. sometimes these people go to Stanton, so that'll be a great question to ask him as well. Um, he's probably aware of this story too, so it'd be interesting to see what he thinks of it. And of course, the and the other thing I spoke about is this document that you're going to talk to Stan about, which many of us feel there are many problems with. So it'll be interesting to hear what Stan has to say. Yes, it will. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I know at first he thought it was pretty good, but I think he may have changed his mind. But actually, I have absolutely no idea what his stand is. So I'm um, taking you know him on with uh, that open question. We'll see what he says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I have a funny Stan story, too. I don't think I've shared this with you before or on your show. So uh, at the museum, so and I was able to go visit Stan, and he's always uh, with Kathleen Martin, you know, someone he's written books with recently. And she's also helping him because, you know, um, he's getting up there and he needs some help. So uh, great, both great people. Mm -hmm. But one year, and this is about a couple years ago, when you go into the museum, uh on the right, in between the stands, is where all the speakers are. And Kathleen and Stan are always first. They're in that first spot. Right. And one year, Stan was sick, and he couldn't make it out there. And so just to make it feel like he was there, Kathleen put a picture of him um, near the seat where he would usually sit. And she was selling the books. But it was just hilarious because people would walk up and you got that impression although I knew better when I first saw it you walk up and you see Kathleen and this picture of Stan everybody thought he had passed away oh. um, and oh, people no. were really freaking out and you know their first reaction is oh my gosh what happened this is so sad and Kathleen's like no 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 she had to explain a lot <laughs> that year no 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 he's fine he's fine yeah yeah I remember that yeah mm -hmm. wow so anything else going on uh, that's about it. I mean, there is some other stuff out there. I just got back, you right. know, um, yeah, from Oz Oswell. And then yesterday was the 4th, so uh, doing some celebration and stuff. So I did update date the site yesterday So and while I was gone. So you have daily news headlines from mm -hmm. all of this week. And there are some interesting headlines out there, such as now that uh, the UK UFO files um, people are taking a look at them and writing some stories about those. So there are a couple interesting um, stories, like uh, these this crew from a Cold War spy plane in the UK that saw some object that was covered with 20 flashing lights. Um, so that's really interesting. So that's a good story out there. But yeah, so there's some interesting headlines. Um, there is a sighting report from Roger Marsh from South Dakota about a disc object that a witness says looked like it broke into two pieces or, or two different objects and flew away. Mm. So uh, that's kind of interesting too, but you can see it all at openminds.tv. Great. All right, Alejandro. Hey, thanks so much. Yep, thank you. All right, and we'll talk to you next week. All righty. And thanks again for doing the show live. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Okay, hang, anyone, er, hang in there, everyone.
Hello. Hi, Stan. How are you? Welcome back to the show. I'm glad to be on again. Yes, and uh, you've been you've been doing a lot of traveling, right? Uh, quite a bit. Yeah, I just got back from uh, an incredibly successful Roswell festival, annual festival, 70th anniversary of the Roswell incident, uh, and uh, best crowd. I mean, 70 percent over last year for the weekend. Whoa. Over well over 7,000 people. Wow. Uh, How do, do they, can they accommodate all those people comfortably there in that town? Well, yeah, they built a few new motels, and they weren't all there at once. Uh, it's over a four-day period, but still, uh, yeah, it, it's it's festival time. They close off some of the streets, and uh, yeah, it's a ball. Um, do you th- is is a lot of it kind of uh, fringy, or is there some? No, no, that's good there, to hear. There isn't any fringy stuff. Uh, good speakers, uh, solid stuff. Uh, I saw. Oh, I saw two tinfoil hats once. <laughs> <laughs> they probably did that as a joke, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 So it, the the tone is certainly not. They've got a new director at the museum, and he's done a great job in updating the place and uh, keeping things running on time and all that sort of stuff. Uh, that was a pleasure. I mean, it's uh, I have to take three flights to get there, so it's oh. a long day <laughs> each way. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's up. That's, uh... Oh, is it? Oh, my God. So you have to fly three different, you have to have two different layovers, basically. And yeah, I fly from here to Montreal, and Montreal to Dallas, and Dallas to Roswell. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and um, in reverse. <laughs> yeah, I really wanted to make it out there. I, I, th- I told you earlier, just when we chatted for a second, I'm over in Russia. Um, but, you know, the uh, 70th would have been a great one to go to, but I'll, I'll get out there one of these years uh um, you know, it should be a lot of fun catching up, uh, you know, with a lot of friends and and uh, it. I just have never even been there, you know, to the town. I've, and I lived in New Mexico at one time. And oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. lived in Los Alamos. <coughs> yeah. Oh, there's a special place. I yeah. like Los Alamos. <laughs> well, only yeah, my my it, yes, Bandelier and all the beautiful parks around there. My. Uh, Sister and brother-in-law, he worked at the labs, and I uh, lived there for about four or five months. So, yeah, it's a beautiful area. Very nice. Um, if it so, can stand the altitude now, it's pretty Yeah, nice. it really takes you, <laughs> takes you a couple of weeks to get used to that, from what I remember. Yeah. Uh, so, Stan, um, we, we had you on, I, I think it was about four or five months ago, something like that. I always love to have you on, and, uh, you know, I, I think you always have a really good message, and... One of the things I wanted to talk to you about was, of course, Roswell. Um, we can get more into that, but after that, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the document that was, you know, came out of uh, Heather Wade's uh, Midnight in the Desert. I know yeah. you had talked about that, um, but first, I want to ask you a little bit more about Roswell. What did you think about the uh, alleged witness? Uh, Alejandro and I just kind of we sort of poked a couple of holes in some of the things that he said. The new witness that supposedly came forward and just i don't just, what new witness is that Wait oh okay this is the one that said he accompanied the police officer and saw the crash on the side of the road um so if you hadn't heard about it i thought it was something that might have been circulating this this last uh, at the well, event i've been tied up I, I was even offline when i was down in roswell i was busy all day long and uh oh. so no i haven't uh yeah. now people better understand i'm my my whole goal is to have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear. Sure, so yeah, I don't yeah. like to express opinions without having data. Uh, I did find some data on the the new MJ12 document, but uh, that and I barely had time to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all. But yeah, you know, digging out facts is not as easy as it sounds. Uh, you know, and I see a lot of people in the field who accept claims as if they were evidence but mm-hmm. claims aren't evidence you need data you need something solid to base the claims on not just because oh it sounds like a great story you know a lot of great stories out there that doesn't make them true and people have been writing science fiction for a long time <laughs> yeah yeah and a lot of times Alejandro and I have brought up and I did with the guests last week um, was the fact that the British tabloids seem to just run with about anything that pops up, and uh, and I think 
you know what happens and a, lo a lot of what happens these days is you know the uh, myths do become reality to a lot of people um, because yeah. it, it's only you know the surface they're only you know like if you're a person let's just say a person on the outside we'll put it that way someone that doesn't really pay attention to UFOs and you see a story you're gonna read the story and see it in the news and think hey hmm that might, you know, that must be real, or you know what I mean. It's it's kind of a shame. Yeah, that, they wouldn't have published that if it wasn't true, would they? Of yeah. course they would if they felt like. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So there's a lot of that going on, but uh, it's really it's really uh, hard these days because of that. It just seems like that's it's. Uh, um, I want to say it's becoming more and more um, watered down, you know. Well, sure, many people have finally recognized that, gee, there's a lot of interest in UFOs. What's wrong with this story? What the hell? Uh, and that's not good enough. Uh, you know, it appeals to people, maybe, but uh, to some people. But they, they believe what they want to believe, I suppose. And if it sounds like it's coming from an orthopedic course, uh, source, then let's go with it, of course. You know, what can I say? Uh, I'm a scientist, not a science fiction writer. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes, uh, Stan, I'll just let you know, we do have uh, questions that do come in to the uh, chat sure. room. We also have a couple of people that have uh, posted some questions up on uh, the forum, which um, I will get to um, when I can. Um, someone wanted to know about, um, and I, I, I'm not familiar to talk about facts in hand. I don't have the facts in hand here. Um, although I had him on my show recently, but w someone wants to know uh, what you think about Kevin Randall's change in position over the years regarding Roswell. Well, I, I'm not satisfied that it's legitimate. I mean, uh, he has the right to take any position he feels like, but I shocked somebody a bit the other day by pointing out that Kevin, I mean, we've known each other for, what, 20 or more years, I suppose, <laughs> but... Uh, and we've disagreed for a good deal of that time. Uh, people forget, Kevin is a very effective writer of fiction. He's written more than 80 books, which is, uh, I'm very, mostly under other names, now not under his own name. And so his standards is what sounds good, uh, not uh, what is true. I mean, uh, all fiction writers, I, I, I read a lot of fiction. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with writing fiction. But it's not the same as nonfiction. Uh, and there are times when Kevin surprises me. Uh, for example, he complained in his first objection to uh, MJ-12 that uh, it says Admiral Roscoe Hill Encoder. Well, he was only a rear admiral. He would never have called himself Admiral. Uh and the fact of the matter is that all the military officers on MJ-12, the generic ranks for use for its standard practice. Uh, general Goodpaster was Ike's staff secretary. He was a brigadier general. Uh, served uh, knew Ike very well. And so uh, and when they had meetings at the White House, he would write minutes and comments and so forth. To, to, you know, the president doesn't write summaries of meetings. <laughs> and uh, uh, writing uh, comments, I just lost where I was going with that. Um, anyway, uh, at, he would list attendees at meetings, including General Goodpaster. He'd sign it Brigadier General Goodpaster. I called two different archivists. And they said it's standard practice. And one pointed out, and I checked, and he was right, that Ike used generic ranks. Uh, and, you know, I, I have meetings where there were five different people given generic ranks. By that I mean general or admiral, as opposed to rear admiral, uh, brigadier general, major general, lieutenant general, four star general, general. Uh, it's standard practice. Now, the reason I bring this up, Kevin was associated with the military for many years. Mm -hmm. I give him credit. You know, he served uh, his country very well. But that was certainly, and he even asked me, show me something else where uh, Hill and Coder uh, described himself as an admiral. 
uh, another signature where he signed. Uh, there is no Hill and Cooter signature on the document. So things like that have bothered me over the years. And I, I once uh, made up a list of 38 false claims that he had made. Uh, you know, fact after fact, or fact, <laughs> maybe I should say factoid, but whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Is a factoid by definition uh, a fact that isn't a fact? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't but know. But so uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't explain, uh, Kevin, like I say, he's a very successful writer, and I, I, I envy him that. I haven't written any fiction. My name is only on six books. Uh, people ask me for forwards for their books, <laughs> which isn't the same thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but uh, we have been at odds about many aspects of it, and we just seem to have different standards. Uh, and, well, there's another thing. He was touting uh, Frank Kaufman as an outstanding witness, uh, and it turns out that Frank didn't witness anything at Roswell. I made all kinds of claims, which had no basis in fact, and it was pretty obvious that they didn't. So we we have disagreed because we come at the problem differently. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, speaking of um, this whole topic, Roswell, um, the you, you, I, I would consider that you you are the person that basically uncovered this forgotten story. Yes. You know, I'm the original civilian investigator of the Roswell incident. That's how I put it. Yes. I notice I said that carefully. I'm not the original investigator because the government was doing a lot of investigating. They had a real problem on their hands. What the heck is going on here? Mm. But, uh, you know, from the public's viewpoint, it was a two-day story. Right. Uh, here today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And it was only when I got involved in the late 70s, and then uh, I had a false start. Uh, it's kind of crazy. I was living in California, talked to a, a what do you call a ranger, um, forest ranger, had a great sighting. You know, those guys are up in the mountains and so forth. And he told me, you really ought to talk to my mom. She had a great sighting in uh, Albuquerque. Okay, so I called his mom, who was Lydia Sleppy. And she worked at a radio station that had a Roswell affiliate. And, uh, her station was called by somebody, the guy in Roswell, dictating a story that uh, she was a, a secretary, basically, not a, a journalist. And he wanted to put it out on the wire, and the Roswell station wasn't on the newswire. And so he was dictating the story, and then for something happened. A bell rang, whatever it was, and there was a transmission. Do not continue this transmission. Right. And she said, what should I do? And the guy says, stop. Huh. <laughs> you know? Well, I talked to her. She told me her story. She gave me some names of some people. This is what happened in 47, you understand, and I'm talking to her in about 74. So mm. It's a long time later. Mm-hmm. And I found some of the people, but I got nowhere. It was a dead end. I mean, oh, yeah, I was there, but I don't remember the details, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, okay, it's sitting in the background. And then, by I won't say by accident, I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to give a lecture at Louisiana State University. 1978. And the kids from the university had taken to me the big, me to the biggest station in town, television station. And I was scheduled to do three interviews. I guess they were short of news that day. I don't <laughs> know. But I did the first two, and the third reporter was nowhere to be found. And the station manager is looking at his watch. He's giving me coffee. And out of the blue, he said something that was provocative. He said, you know, the guy you really ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel, brilliant investigator that I am. I said, who's he? (laughs) He handled wreckage of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. What? (laughs) You know, he wasn't making a joke, and there was nobody around. Uh, He was clearly being serious. Well, what do you know about him? He lives in Homa. I didn't know where Homa was. I was there later (laughs) to talk to Jesse, but uh, I followed up. The, The reporter showed up. I did the interview, was busy the rest of the day. The talk went very well that night. Big crowd, no nasty, noisy negativists giving me a hard time or anything like that. So the next morning from the airport, I called information in HOMA. Now, you understand that there are today people who think that the way you find phone numbers is go on the Internet. Yeah. Well, back then you called information. Yeah, 411, yeah. 
Yeah, and the nice thing was that uh, oftentimes the the person you got lived in the area, and you could say, is that a nice part of town, and things like that. You could learn quite a bit that way. They're knowledgeable. Mm. So anyway, I got a number for Jesse. I explained that I was a nuclear physicist who'd been investigating UFOs for at that time for uh, 10 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd been talking to, uh, his name was Alan, uh, the, the guy at the television station. Oh, yeah, he knew him. They, they were ham radio buddies. And I found out later, when I asked Jesse what he, or, or I asked uh, Bill Allen what Jesse had told him, he hadn't told him anything. When, when he asked Jesse, Jesse said, I can't talk about that. What he had done was seen the article in the newspaper, the uh, New Orleans Times Picayune, I think it's called, a weird name for a newspaper. But uh, anyway, uh, back then, when you mentioned the GI, you normally put what town is hometown. So that's how the two uh, made contact and so forth. So he told me a story, and I was very impressed. Um, as a nuclear guy, I mean, here we have the the uh, intelligence officer for the only atomic bombing group in the world in 1947. Mm-hmm. Now, you don't get to be that by being a dink. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're very important. Uh, you know, it's kind of crazy. Uh, once in England, I was on a panel, and there was an English astronomer there. Why would an alien go to New Mexico? There's nothing there but sand, he huh. said. And I asked him, well, have you ever been there? Well, no. And then you're not aware that two of the three nuclear weapons labs in the United States are in New Mexico? That the first atomic bomb was exploded at the Trinity site in New Mexico? That White Sands missile range is where we fired all our captured German V-2 rockets. Now, he goesn't know where or any of that. <laughs> uh, the reason you f- let off bombs and fire rockets is there aren't many people in New Mexico. There's a lot of land, a lot of sand, indeed. But uh, you can't do those things, testing nuclear weapons and so forth, when there are a lot of people around. You know, mm-hmm. it's not very convenient. Uh, the contrast here to me, I grew up in New Jersey. And now New Jersey has, it's the most densely populated of all the states. Uh, Mm. Eight million people in 8,000 square miles. Mm. Uh, The the population density is about 40 times what it is in New Mexico. Mm -hmm, Right. Uh, So it's kind of crazy. New Mexico is a a special sort of place. And uh, I, I think that Roswell was a, his, a historic event, but it also was a challenge. I mean, this is two years after the war, mm-hmm. which ended because of an atomic bomb when it was first tested. Uh, incidentally, uh, for people who think, oh, governments wouldn't lie to us, would they? Well, first atomic bomb test, uh, July 16th, I think it was, 1945, was seen from 100 miles away, an awful big <laughs> explosion. And the sheriffs were getting uh, telephone calls from, you know, what happened? I saw this crazy thing. 5.30 in the morning, you understand, but in New Mexico, it's not uncommon for people to get up early because it gets pretty hot during the day. Mm-hmm. You got up over 100 in Roswell every day last week, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, and they they put out a, 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 a lie, a cover story. That sounds much better to <laughs> Uh, an ammunition dump had blown up. Unfortunately, nobody was hurt. Uh, three weeks later, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they finally admitted what it was. So government agencies, and I don't blame them for lying. It's like they were very careful not warning the Japanese about uh, dropping in a horrible bomb on them because they were afraid they'd move prisoners of war there. Perfectly good reason for not to, you know, not saying... You watch what we do to you. Oh, sure, we'll put our prisoners there. Then drop your bomb. You know, there there were serious concerns about these things. So anyway, uh, the the question of the meaning is also, uh, you know, a little question. Do these guys mean us harm? Mm -hmm. What The government didn't know what they wanted. They didn't know where they were from. What they did know is that they had technology. Kenneth Arnold's sighting was uh, June 24th, 1947. Roswell was uh, less than two weeks later. And there were about a thousand 
uh, sightings we now know in, in between those two periods of time. Were there really so, that many? Yeah, we didn't know it. Well, even today, uh, you realize that MUFON gets over 500 sighting reports a month. Mm -hmm. And I've had people say, well, I haven't heard anything about any sightings in the last few months. <laughs> you didn't hear about it, but it was they were there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, the government had to decide, what do we do? And the thing is, okay, they recovered wreckage. That doesn't tell you how the darn thing works, does it? Oh, that's nice looking equipment. What does it do? What's it made out of? You know, how can we duplicate it, et cetera, et cetera? It, it's not easy. And certainly, even today, should we put out on the table what we have learned from examination of records at Roswell, at Aztec, and Kecksburg, uh, without the Russians and Chinese putting out what they know? Hmm. It'd be damn foolish. You know, because we may have learned some things that they haven't learned. We'd like to know what they know. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. the, the overwhelming thing about a flying saucer is its potential for military utilization of that technology. Think about it. The military budget on planet Earth this year, a trillion dollars. Huh. I mean, you know, it's a sad tale. Look how many kids died of starvation last year or last week, last month. Right. But... I'm saying it's clear that military applications are of great significance uh, to governments, and secrecy is of great significance. And uh, don't tell me, I, I have people tell me, oh, we can't, in today's world, with YouTube and the Internet, you can't keep secrets. Of course you can. We don't publish classified documents on the Internet. I, I'm not saying there aren't occasional slips by people, but uh, secrets are easy to keep need to know an appropriate security level uh, you put them together and they scare the hell out of you I worked under security for 14 years and one time I was giving a presentation and my slides weren't ready when they were supposed to be ready so they made me a special courier to carry these classified slides and they sat me down and stressed you know these, doc these slides stay with you not in the trunk of the car that you're driving with you and if we need your itinerary because if the plane crashes we're going after the classified material we don't care about you huh. uh, yeah, I was glad to get rid of those <laughs> <laughs> wow. but yeah. I, 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 I get people tell me oh well all those guys the MJ-12 people would have told their wives what they were doing no I never told my wife anything classified I'd be breaking the rules, and you don't know where the spies are, and I can't control what she says. She wouldn't know it was hurting anybody, you know. So security doesn't work. Uh, when you turn on YouTube, you may see a lot of interesting stuff, and some of it may even be true. But you're not seeing classified stuff. And anybody who thinks secrets can't be kept big ones, uh, the, first <laughs> the first spy satellite was the Corona spy satellite. Corona is a little town in New Mexico, incidentally. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, also a Toyota Corona. I drove <laughs> several of them. But uh, they, uh, that satellite, we, we knew that the U-2 had a limited life, the spy plane, you know, because uh, the Russians were getting better, and eventually they did knock one down. Uh, the Corona sp spy satellite, the first 12 launches were done in secret, in secret and were failures. <laughs> mm. Wow. That's a lot of money, 12 spy satellite launches. This is back in the early 60s or late 50s, really. It's a wonder they didn't the give up, really. Well, uh, yeah, they didn't run out of money, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody knows what you're spending. Uh, the 13th satellite got more data about Soviet military construction. It's pretty hard to know what's going on over there. It's an awfully big country, you know, and they, so who knows what they're doing. Got more data than all the U-2 flights had preceded it. Hmm. Do you think we triumph? We trumpeted, you'll pardon the expression, uh, <laughs> that great uh, breakthrough? No. That satellite was classified for 30 years, and we didn't talk about it. Huh. Uh, Lockheed developed the stealth aircraft, and it cost it $10 billion over 10 years in secret. Uh, so, and there's a whole bunch more programs. Well, the, also, well, one of the myths around is that, oh, research is what's done when you work at a university, in academia, right? 
Well, sometimes. But when I was working on nuclear airplanes, in 1958, at General Electric, our budget that year was $100 million. Hmm. We employed 3,400 people, 1,100 of them were engineers and scientists. This wasn't six professors and 20 grad students. Hmm. It was a huge effort. And it was great fun until they canceled the program. You know, I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I worked on a lot of canceled programs. But what I'm saying is the public <laughs> doesn't seem to have much recognition of how big these programs can be, how expensive they can be, and frankly, how productive. Look at the Manhattan Project. You know that 5% of all the electricity being produced in the United States in the last two years of the war went for pushing, uh, separating uranium isotopes, pumping uranium hexafluoride through uh, big sheets of metal with little holes in it, and U-235 goes through a lot faster, so eventually 5% of all the power in the United States went into that. Amazing. In I mean, that's a lot of dough. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's and, and so huge. what I'm saying yeah. is we have many examples of projects that went on. I'm not saying they were all uh, sensible or uh, appropriate or whatever. Many programs got canceled because uh, you went for a while. Ah, it ain't gonna work. Let's let's stop it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or somebody else came along with a better story. Mm -hmm. But it, it's important to realize that secrets can be kept, and that there's a need for secrecy. Uh, oh yeah. You know, if your buddy knows what you're, if your enemy knows what you're doing. He's in a much better position to stop you from doing it when the chips are down. Hmm. You know, and that, that's warfare. But this planet is doing a lot about warfare. The United States spends more than what? The next 15 countries together? Right. Yeah. Uh, something like that. Uh, so obviously it's of great significance and importance and so forth. And so and people ask me, don't you think we are entitled to know everything? No, I don't think that. I think there is a national security aspect which makes me a strange person to some people. Uh, uh, he's for secrecy, uh, as appropriate, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it actually comes to, you know, security, national security, I totally get that. Um, going back to uh, Jesse Marcel, um, there's a, a question uh, that I've never heard on the uh, this on the message board, and it says uh, that... Uh, did Jesse Marcel likely lie in interviews with UFO researchers on his background, education, and status as a pilot? Is that anything you've ever heard? Well, there are people who make wild uh, claims. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, people say he flew, I, I forget how many miles it was. He didn't say he was flying the airplane. I mean, I, I'm a big frequent flyer. I've flown I'm a million mile, mile or on uh, Air Canada and uh, uh, Delta. That doesn't mean I flew any of those airplanes. But that's uh, you see the subtle difference there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I refer to the fact that even though we didn't go to West Point, and Colonel Blanchard, the base commander, did go to West Point, and General Ramey did, uh, Blanchard's boss, and uh, Thomas Jefferson DuBose, who was his adjutant, I spoke with him. I was too late to talk to Blanchard and Ramey. They were dead. I don't know how to cross that barrier. Some people do, <laughs> but I can't. You know? uh, and so, uh, is that your phone? Or? Not, not my phone. No, it's, it's. Uh, it sounds like in the background, but we'll just continue. That's okay. Okay. Uh, let me pick that up for just a second. Sure, yeah, yeah. Hello. Goodbye. <laughs> it, all right. Somebody trying to sell me something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep, the other line. Uh, okay, yeah, I forgot. That I, I've got two phones here. Uh, and I don't have one to each ear. <laughs> 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 I've heard of people doing that, but I am not able to do that. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, I was I did I'm one of the few researchers who actually I was in Jesse's home in beautiful down <laughs> in Oma, Louisiana. I was in his son's home. Uh, Jesse Jr. is a medical doc was a medical doctor died a couple years back. Uh, was a flight surgeon. 
uh, served, the, would you believe he was called back in at age 68? Wow. He served as a helicopter pilot in the Middle East. Amazing. Great guy. Yeah. I was in his home in Montana. Uh, greatest respect for both of them. Mm-hmm. But my point is, uh, people have leveled all kinds of accusations that everybody involved with all of this. I mean, uh, one guy called uh, Colonel Blanchard, oh, he was a loose cannon. Uh, he, he was a big guy, uh, Blanchard, uh, but uh, as indication that that's a hasty judgment, he got four more promotions, was a four-star general and vice chief of staff of the Air Force when he died of a massive heart attack at the Pentagon in the mid-60s. Mm-hmm. Now, each one of those promotions had to be approved by Congress, and along the way, he oversaw the... Uh, the Air Corps guys with the nuclear weapons, thousands of nuclear weapons under his control. We're supposed to believe that the government is so incompetent that they picked a loose cannon do a job like that. I don't believe it for a minute. Uh, I did talk to Blanchard's uh, daughter and two sons, incidentally. But uh, uh, So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that you hear. It sounds great. Oh, he was just a loose cannon. Really? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Uh, the, the evidence doesn't indicate that. Uh, and there have been uh, charges made about many of the people involved because it's easier to to do that than to do your research. Uh, you know, I, I get people who never talk to any of the key people, but they know what the truth is mm-hmm. and who don't. I've been to 20 archives. Uh, and, you know, the, the classic example of that Mr. Philip J. Class, Senior Avionics Editor for Aviation Week and Space Technology. He said every sighting has a prosaic explanation. Now, one of the MJ-12 documents, a little, just a paragraph memo from Bobby Cutler, who was Ike's National Security Advisor, uh, to General Nathan Twining, who was a member of MJ-12. And Phil Class says, well, obviously you didn't notice that that document's done in the large PICA type, but the National Security Council, it says NSC at the top, used only elite type. And I got nine samples to prove it, and he says to me in a letter, making much noise about it, uh, I challenge you to find any other genuine documents done in the same size and style type, and I'll give you $100 each up to a maximum of 1000 uh, ten documents, and uh, I looked at my files. I found twenty PICA type documents very quickly, but they didn't meet all his criteria. Had a list of things that had to be true. But I was going to the Truman Library, so I dug things out, uh, or to the Eisenhower Library. Sorry, I went. I go to both on the same trip normally, and I found fourteen that met all his criteria, sent him copies and an invoice for $1,000, <laughs> and he paid me. Right. And, I, and he got madder than heck when uh, I included a copy of his check to me in a book. <laughs> he was going to sue me and all that stuff. And I wrote him, Phil, you sent me a check. I Xeroxed it. The <laughs> bank cashed the check. I can do whatever I darn please with the Xerox, and he shut up. But here's the kicker. I didn't know it until after this. He had never been to the Eisenhower Library. Hmm. I spent weeks there. I mean, that's typical of the intellectual bankruptcy of the pseudoscience of anti-ufology. And it means you have to watch out. Uh, And my latest book with Kathleen Martin, Fact, Fiction, and Flying Saucers, we explore uh, especially three people, Dr. Edward U. Condon, great physicist who headed the Condon study at the University of Colorado, and Dr. Donald Menzel and Mm -hmm. Phil Class, and trying to figure out why did these people say the dumb things they did. Uh, Condon, look, I'm a physicist. He was president of the American Physical Society, had an enviable record, and yet he was ridiculous enough to say, we can be sure that there won't be alien visitations for at least 10,000 years. (laughs) <laughs> you know, who can look 10,000 years into the future? Who can look 100 years into the future, you know? And why would now, you just, Donald, just on that, that matter, how why would that make a difference anyway? Because, you know, the, the way, uh, you know, a species would evolve on different planets is anyone's guess. 
you're right about that. <laughs> I don't do any guessing on that. <laughs> yeah, it's well, crazy. Well, you know, with the Menzel, at least, I found the reason. Here, here we have a Harvard University professor, chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard. Now, it's pretty darn clear you don't need a security clearance to mm -hmm. <laughs> head the astronomy department. So why was he wrote three anti-UFO books? He, he preceded class as the leading skeptic. Or debunker is a much better word. A skeptic says, I don't know. A debunker says, oh, I know, there's nothing to that. Anyway, it's a long story, which is in my books, but I won't, such as Top Secret Magic, all about Majestic Hope. But the reason for him, I found out, much to my surprise, was that it turns out, I found a letter from him to President Kennedy, Dear Jack, they knew each other quite wow. well. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's one area, this is after uh, Jack's election. He would, had been on the board of overseers of Harvard, and his area of interest was astronomy. And uh, that's how he dealt with, the, got to know Menzel. This is before he was president. And they he would even have breakfast together. Uh, and I found... I had to get permission from three different people to look at his papers. Uh, I saw a letter from an attorney to another member of MJ-12 thanking him for all his help in getting Don Menzel off on the charges of disloyalty. I mean, after all, he led an eclipse expedition to Russia in the mid-30s. Obviously, he's not a faithful American. What, what nonsense. Anyway, uh, I wound up going to the Harvard archives after getting permission from three people. And there's a letter from Menzel to Kennedy saying, uh, there's one area where I may be of assistance to you. It's with regard to the huge national security agency, the NSA. Uh, when we are properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more. I've been associated with them for 30 years. What? Mm. <laughs> you know? And he, it turns out he did work for the CIA. He did all kinds of classified work mm. that nobody knew about. And I say nobody, nobody knew about it because... There are two special issues of Sky and Telescope dedicated to Donald Menzel. The first was on the, at the point of his death, and the second was at the 100th anniversary of his birth. Neither one said anything about his post-World War II work mm. for the government that was so highly classified. So I, I didn't like the man while he was alive. I had one run-in with him. I was speaking at Harvard that evening, and I called to invite him to my lecture, because it was to an engineering alumni association. I had no idea how much publicity they had done, you know, other than to their members. Uh, so I called him, gave him my name. Oh, I know all about you, he said. And I said, oh, you read my congressional testimony next to yours? No, <laughs> you can't be a scientist and believe in flying saucers. I laughed, of course. Yeah. He got angry. <laughs> 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 Dr. Come, uh, Dr. Menzel, I didn't call to argue with you. I called out of courtesy. I'm speaking on your campus. Uh, I'm speaking at 8 o'clock in such and such hall, and I'd be happy to have you there. Oh, well, of course I won't be there. Hmm. So I told the story that night, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then, so I, I was not an admirer of Donald Menzel. But once I found out all his classified activities, this was after his death. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew about him during his, his uh, life. Uh, I developed an appreciation for I could un I, I could understand him. In other words, mm -hmm. when you serve in your country, you do what you're supposed to do. And uh, Kevin Randall uh, mentioned that I hadn't found anything that mentioned MJ12 in his papers. Of course not. A man who had all those years of work with classified materials going to leave stuff lying around. Classified material belongs in a special safe, yep. a combination safe that's fire-resistant. You know, there's a whole bunch of rules and, and so forth. And I did talk to Menzel's secretary, and he was very security conscious. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that's a terrible... Yes, I, it, it is true. I did not find anything in writing from Menzel that said, yeah, I'm a proud member of MJ-12 or anything mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. you know. But I certainly wouldn't have expected to. Right. And so that leaves Phil Class, and we don't know who he was working for, but I'd say somebody. He used to say that and nobody can show that I work for a three letter agency, you know, CIA, NSA. What if it had four letters? <laughs> <laughs> he got around that. And if there's anybody listening, 
uh, I'd be happy to hear of any knowledge that they have uh, of Phil Class, who was an, another one who was an excellent writer. Uh, no question about that. Uh, he just didn't get his facts straight about UFOs. Yeah, uh, standard practice, I guess. He seemed very angry about the topic. You know, you're right, and and I don't fully understand that. He even complained about people suggesting that that somebody was lying. You have to lie to protect security, darn it. Hmm. Uh, you tiptoe. I, the way I put it is, sometimes you have to tiptoe around the truth. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, uh, hey, it's a massive effort keeping secrets. I got a question here from the forum, and uh, it's sort of a little bit of the cons conspiracy uh, angle here about uh, the government and cover-ups. Do you believe the government is capable of something as drastic to the extent of killing any potential whistleblowers in order to keep the ET secret? Secrecy? Well, I know they you, threatened it, or uh, there's uh, alleged yeah. threats. I found one guy that had worked uh, at the White House, and he very quietly said that, uh, what's the term, white, uh, th there's a term that indicates wet, wet jobs, hmm. uh, that he knew of a case, and he hated to admit it, but he knew of a case in which somebody was taken out because he'd been sloppy about security. Uh, all I can tell you is repeat that as a secondhand story, but... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, there are times, you know, you have to weigh consequences if I do and if I don't. Uh, if your enemy finds out what you're doing soon enough to stop you from doing it, that may mean a terrible thing. You know, and so I, I, I'm not saying they're evil. I'm saying there are rules of the game, and sometimes you have to do things which aren't very pleasant including taking out your own people. Hmm. Um, now, getting back to Jesse Marcel and you interviewing him and all yeah. of that, what do you think Roswell would be if uh, Jesse Marcel uh, didn't live long enough or, or never said anything? Do you think eventually it would have been exposed? That's a very good question, and I haven't thought about it a lot, but I, on the one hand, my pride says, oh, nobody else could have gotten that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Being in the right place at the right time, you know. Mm. Uh, on, on the other hand, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody else had come forward on their dying days. You, you know what I mean? An act of conscience. There are people who get fed up with the government, you know, who think that maybe their grandchild is entitled to know something like that. Because there isn't, can you think of anything more significant than recognition that there are other beings out there right. in our neighborhood? Hmm. That's, that's, that's a very big story. So I can't say it wouldn't have come out. But when I look at how fortunate the circumstances were, I mean, I, I don't think it was ever in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and certainly not with the guy who happened to know Jesse. <laughs> so, yeah, that, yeah. the odds of all so, that uh, happening the way it did, are very slim. Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm glad it happened. Uh, I feel very fortunate. I feel honored. Uh, there is a, um, what do you call it, a DVD out now, Recollections of Roswell, that uh, has testimony from 23 first-hand witnesses who are all dead now, except mm -hmm. one. And he's an old man. A very old man, as you can imagine. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, and it includes testimony with, of Jesse. So for people who think that, oh, it's all lost in history, they can actually listen to first-hand testimony from people who were involved. And, you know, I, I will be the first to admit that sometimes investigators get lucky. <laughs> After mm -hmm. talking to Jesse... I checked editor and publisher, which is a listing of all the newspapers and magazines in the country, and I went to the library, did my homework, and I looked up Roswell. I didn't know anything about Roswell, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, they have a newspaper. I had two, actually. Roswell Daily Record. 
So I call the newspaper, ask for the editor from 1947. This is in 1978. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, he's long gone. What do you need? Well, I've got some articles here. Bill Moore and I had dug out some articles, uh, looking up Roswell and stuff. And uh, it says that the base public information officer, I didn't even know the base had been closed in the mid-60s. That's another story. A uh, guy named Walter Howe taught, because his name is spelled four different ways <laughs> in the newspaper articles. <laughs> and before I could finish the sentence, the person on the other end says, oh, his wife works here. What? <laughs> Total ex- <laughs> Walter was the public information officer. He was also, a fact never mentioned by the noisy negativists, a World War II bombardier with more than 20 missions over Japan. He also was chosen to drop the instrument package when they exploded an A-bomb in 1946 at Operation Crossroads. You pick your best guy to do that, because you don't have many atom bombs to waste back at that time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and without the instrument, what, what good was the test, you know? So sometimes you get lucky, is what I'm saying. Walter, I talked to the wife, and uh, Walter's gone, so is uh, his wife. But uh, he had a base yearbook, and you have a copy of it. So it was a great help in finding people. Because you find one guy, and they mention other people, and you dig out their names. It, it's a lot of work, but because we didn't have an internet back then. But uh, like I say, you got to take advantage of the lucky times when you stumble on something and follow up on it. Right. So. It uh, makes me wonder too. I wonder if there's any other Roswell type situation that was just swept away and and forgotten. Well, I think that. <laughs> Quite frankly, there was. I, I can't tell you what it was, obviously, or, or then you couldn't say it was forgotten. But <laughs> I've had enough experience with classified material, having had a clearance for 14 years at several different companies. So it wasn't just one company. I worked, And I worked for the big guys, you know, General Electric, General Motors, Westinghouse, mm-hmm. McDonnell Douglas Astronautics, or Gen- General Nucleonics. I think I set a record for working on kinds of government-sponsored <laughs> programs. <laughs> So it, I, I would think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things I was thinking about earlier, when you're talking about classified and government secrets, um, what do you think? A lot of people uh, say that they think the um, the triangles that they see flying over, you know, without any sound, large triangles. Um, a lot of people are attributing them to, you know, a secret government project. And I don't know if they are or they're not. I have no idea. Um, the question is, do you think that's a, a possibility? Well, I think it is. But uh, I'm I'm wary. Uh, you know, I get people, I remember uh, in the Phoenix Lights, mm-hmm. uh, I was debating with a military guy at a forum at a college, and uh, uh, he, he was acting like, uh, well, those weren't qualified witnesses, and we we're talking about the four women who were together. Watch this big triangular-shaped thing, more boomerang than triangle, but uh, and it blotted out the stars. They said, and it made no noise. And well, they weren't qualified witnesses. Now, how qualified do you have to be <laughs> to say I'm standing outside with my friends and look up, and here's this big old thing coming along, and it took. Uh, much time to cross over and didn't make a sound and we couldn't see the stars when it went in front of them people were out to see the comet that night so there were a lot of people Mm -hmm. and uh, how qualified do you have to be what kind of an objection is that (laughs) you know they they didn't give you numbers on what the size of the thing was or Mm -hmm. the power level of its engines if it had engines and so forth but it's crazy you know one of the things that's analogous to this is people say eyewitness testimony isn't reliable. Right. Well, the reason we can explain most sightings is that <laughs> eyewitness testimony tends to be reliable. It's, the person doesn't know that it was Venus he was watching, just happened to be out late at night, and there was the brightest thing in the sky. Uh, but we know it was Venus because if we look at the direction he was pointing and the elevation above the horizon, you know, put his arm out to where he was looking because he was a good witness mm-hmm. uh, 
you know, you, you don't expect them to give you serial numbers or the parts inside, for goodness <laughs> sake. I remember having a talk with uh, Seth Shostak. I know you debated him. And yeah. uh, basically he said uh, um, that he didn't believe that, uh, well, first of all, that eyewitness testimony doesn't hold up in court. That was one of the things he said. And he also said that he didn't think an astronaut or a, a police officer or a pilot were any more qualified as a eyewitness than anyone else, which... I totally disagree well, which, with myself. Yeah, I totally disagree with that, too. Yes, I, I, actually, I like Seth, and I noticed in his most recent article uh, that he's changed his attitude about things. You know, I, I've been fighting a battle with the SETI community for a long time uh -huh. uh, that's supposed to stand for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and I say it stands for Silly Effort to Investigate, S-E-T-I. <laughs> but I see that Seth has backed off uh, a bit saying that, well, they wouldn't know we were here until fairly recently, and from a couple of hundred light years, we wouldn't have had time to receive a signal from them, uh, and so forth. And he's acting as if the the only information that aliens would have about us, is, or we would have about aliens, is what they would tell us. Well, you know, Columbus didn't send signals, uh, smoke signals, to the <laughs> Indians before he went across the pond. Uh, I, I think mm -hmm. that's a, a false analogy. Uh, hmm. And I'm glad to see him backing off a bit. I mean, let's face it. Uh, I won the debate. There was a vote from the audience. This was on uh, Coast to Coast Radio. And 57% uh, said I won, 33% said he won, and 10% said I don't know who won the debate. Hmm. But the, the SETI, uh, and I, I, I did do something kind of sneaky. We did the debate, and uh, we each gave three lectures on a cruise from uh, England to New York. Not much doing in the North Atlantic in the middle of winter, incidentally. <laughs> 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 and in the course of my lecture, I talked about five large-scale scientific studies. I presented slides on what was in the studies, like Blue Book Special Report 14, or the uh, Congressional Hearings of 1968, lots of data. And after each one, I asked how many here have read this. And this is on board the ship. And Seth's hand didn't go up for any of them. And that's that's typical. I rarely get more than a couple percent of read any of the major sources of data. Uh, you know, look, a, a guy uh, interrupted me three times when I was speaking to a Gulf Research Labs lecture. And uh, so I turned to him at the end of the lecture so he could ask the first question. Well, I'm sure one could come to other conclusions than the one you came to, he said. I said, well, as I recall, you hadn't read any of those five large-scale scientific studies, had you? Well, no. I said, well, very quietly, that, that's the difference between us, isn't it? I gave you my conclusions. I showed you the evidence on which I based my conclusions. I've read them all. You've read none of them. Whose opinion is worth more? Uh. <laughs> Long silence. Yeah. In other words, I didn't yell and shriek and fuss. Yep. Uh, but it's pr pretty obvious, if you haven't looked at any of the data, you're not entitled to a, quote, scientific, unquote, opinion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's one of the hazards. But, it you know, it was something that bothered me when I first started to speak uh, back in <laughs> 1967. That's, what, 50 years of speaking? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, I... I was afraid somebody was going to come up who would destroy my arguments somehow. You know, I didn't know how. Maybe he was an insider who knew something that about some secret program that made flying saucers, you know, or something like that. But I <laughs> gradually lost that fear because it just just didn't happen. I've only had 11 hecklers in well over 700 lectures. Wow. And two of them were drunk. Uh -huh. And you're going to get that many if you talk about sports, religion, politics, etc., and, mm -hmm. you know, I've been very pleased sometimes um, at the University of Manitoba uh, in Winnipeg. Uh, somebody at the end of my lecture, we had a packed house, some people sitting in the aisles. Uh, he said, how about polling this audience? I'd given some Gallup poll data. Everybody thinks nobody believes in UFOs, but that's not true. And the greater the education, the more likely to believe. Anyway, he said, how about polling this audience? Oh, well, okay, uh, I normally, I stick my neck out, I don't ask my audience to, well, I don't think anybody would mind, everybody clapped, so okay. 
well over 90%. This is after my lecture now. Hmm. I don't know what it would have been before my lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, but well over 90% thought some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. Remember, the right question is not, are all UFOs alien spacecraft? The question is, are any? You know, the basketball coach understands, yes, most people aren't seven feet tall. Give me one. You know, yeah. That'll do. Yep. <laughs> you know, if I'm interested in nuclear fission, well, most isotopes aren't fissionable. So what? Give me the one that is. We make a lot of effort to do that. So you, you've got to focus in the right place. And nobody would say that uh, Babe Ruth was a lousy baseball player. Because, does anybody know who Babe Ruth is these days? <laughs> <laughs> I think still, yes. <laughs> I, well, I think so. But two-thirds of the time, he didn't get a hit, at least two-thirds of the time. Uh, it's the hits that matter, not the outs. You know? mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, Belinda in the chat room wanted to know, during. she says, during the conferences, people, uh, now I don't know if this is true or not, I've never heard this, but people are pushing you to uh, change your position on Bob Lazar, and uh, she wanted to know <laughs> what, you, what your reflection was about, of this. Well, I don't know if your audience knows who Bob Lazar is. I... Uh, He's a, a smart guy who made claims, what, 20 years ago? Has it been that long? Yeah, I yeah. think it has. Mm -hmm. That uh, he uh, was working on figuring out how flying saucers work, that he had a, a master's degree in nuclear physics from MIT and a master's in electronics from Caltech. And uh, he was working on figuring out how, fly, how flying saucers worked using mysterious element 115. You know, so people kept asking me about him. He was on George Knapp's show, and he, he's a smart guy. And let, let's, I'm, I'm not saying he's an idiot at all. I'm saying he's a liar. Because I, George gave me information on where Bob went to high school. I called his high school. Uh, I said, I'm getting different information about this man, and uh, can you tell me anything? Well, call me back. I'll check, get, get, get his records. Uh, okay, he got his records, called back. Uh, let's see, he graduated in August, not with his class. There's already a warning sign. That usually means you flunked something. Uh, I said, okay, uh, did he, what science course? He must have taken a lot of science courses, chemistry. What else? Chemistry. Uh oh. If, if he went to MIT, he had more than a chemistry had to have more than a chemistry course. I said, "Well, he was valedictorian, wasn't he?" She laughed. <laughs> I said, "He wasn't. No. Was he in the top ten? No. Top twenty? No. Top fifty? No." She's laughing at this time. Top hundred. No, he was like 262 out of 365, bottom third. So already I knew he was in trouble. <laughs> you know, you can't, uh, there's a personal side to this. I was accepted at MIT out of high school. I was valedictorian in my high school class. I couldn't afford to go. The tuition was $900. Now it's like 29000 but, you know. Uh, so I was resenting somebody saying he'd gone to MIT. I talked to five different people in MIT. In, in, including the guy who should know about whether the registrar's office and all those people about, is there any way to erase somebody's records? Because the, the excuse was, well, the, the government erased his files. Mm -hmm. And he said, frankly, no. You can't give out a grade point average without permission of the person you're asking about. You know, there are rules to the game, you know, privacy and all this sort of stuff. But no, there's no way to erase that a guy went there. So, uh, anyway, uh, Bob and I also conceded that Bob did work at Los Alamos. His name was in the phone book. But some people think uh, if you work at Los Alamos, you must be a scientist. Well, most people who work there aren't scientists. Mm -hmm. I mean, you need support people and secretaries and cooks and guards and all kinds of technicians, lots of technicians. Thank God for them. Uh, and so... You know, what can I say? Well, uh, Bob was... is running a company called United Nuclear. Right. He sells scientific equipment and stuff, but he is not a scientist. And, you know, people say, well, I had a friend of his calling. 
It was a friendly conversation. It wasn't nasty. Uh, well, what would it take to convince you that Bob was telling the truth? I said, well, uh, I'd like to see copies of his diplomas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, stuff like that. Papers that he's written. A resume. That would be nice. It was back in the time when I always had a resume around me <laughs> and uh, stuff. And so uh, I, I sent him copies of my stuff eight-page resume. <laughs> so when you work for a lot of companies, it takes up a lot of room, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I never got anything from him. So I was trying to be fair. And George Knapp and I still get along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing, I've and someone put this up in the chat room, and I remembered hearing something about this that someone asked him, what was the statue out front of MIT? and Or, or was it the square or something? Um, and he couldn't answer that question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> and uh, well, you know, yeah. you, you should be able to establish you went there for goodness' sakes. Yeah, I, I would think so. I would think so. Let's uh, let's talk about um, the document now um, that was. Uh, oh yes. Given to Heather Wade. Um, I personally. Well, maybe I shouldn't give you my opinion on it. Maybe maybe I should just hear your opinion on it. Well, I'd like to hear yours after, after I give you mine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Heather called me. I've done a couple of shows with her. I greatly appreciate she's a very bright lady. And uh, I'm uh, having written a whole book, Top Secret Magic, M-A-J-I-C, about uh, MJ-12. I was, of course interested to say the least and i'm convinced there was an mj-12 and i'm convinced that most of the early documents were fraudulent okay i was able to show why as a matter of fact uh so i, I it it was difficult though because i was traveling and the thing was very hard to read it's uh, like 48 pages two to a two to a sheet and i had to get a big magnifier in order to read it so it took a lot more oh, yes. time than one would have thought. Yeah, it was really You've hard it, to I read. Take it. Really hard to read. Yeah, it, it, it was. So I read it with interest. And the thing is, you can't just look at a document like that. You, you've got to check. If you're going to say it's a fraud, you've got to say, well, because A, B, C, D, E, F, et cetera. Now, I was able to check uh, since uh, I got that from Heather. Um, it is noted that Truman... President Truman supposedly met with aliens in Vermont while he was president on a certain date. Uh, so I checked with the Truman Library. The presidential libraries are loaded with information. They have all the calendars, every meeting the president ever had, and so forth and so on. So they're, they're very obliging. They'll, they'll give you information if you give them a specific date. Where was he? Or, you know, tell me what was on his calendar for that day. He definitely was in Washington. He had meetings with people that are spelled out and so forth. There was a second item where supposedly Ike met with aliens at Kirtland, which is in New Mexico, on a certain date. Uh, and there again, when I checked with the Eisenhower Library, they, they got back to me, and uh, uh, he was in Washington that day, lots of meetings. And so, you know, we didn't have supersonic transports moving presidents around <laughs> at that time that for super-secret meetings. Yeah. Well, and people forget, when a president travels, there's an entourage. Oh, yeah. you got to protect them, security people, and so forth. And there, there are records. It may not be in the New York Times that day or what he was doing, but somebody knows. And after he's out of office, they certainly have, you know, loads of files. I, I love presidential libraries. I've been to several of them, but... It's a good place to get solid information. You don't just settle for guessing. What's that? Well, uh, I should add that there were some things in the document that were <laughs> that conversation with the supposed alien. Oh yes, yeah. Was is is hokey a good word to use? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I did have Kevin on recently, Kevin Randall, and w we talked about the document, and that's the part that um, I said to him, basically, um, the, the person that wrote those questions didn't watch Arrival. Now, there was a movie Arrival. I don't know if you got to see that, Stan. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, so but uh, they asked some real logical questions that were really, really well thought out. Um, whoever wrote that script um, 
which would be something typical you would ask someone coming from you know another planet or you know solar system or whatever um, and no those questions the questions themselves just didn't make any sense and you know who knows what an alien's going to answer maybe they do like trees <laughs> that's in the document <laughs> so um, so who do you think would uh, take the time to do all that work and why well, you know, that's a good question, because uh, when I started to do my research on the original batch of documents, there were, people, people forget, I say there were four genuine ones, and there's dozens of phony ones. Now, how did I establish that they were phony? Well, there was uh, a mention of General Wiedemeyer uh, having something to do with MJ-12. And I called the Marshall Archives. Uh, George Marshall was the Secretary of Defense during World War II, and uh, outstanding record, and Truman considered him the outstanding living American. Uh, anyway, I called the Marshall Archives, uh, and I asked, uh, do you see any reason why General Wiedemeyer, I'd, I'd been there, so the guy knew who I was and stuff, and knew about my work on MJ-12, can you say any reason why General Wiedemeyer would have been part of this? He was a China expert. He spent a year in China in the 40s. And he said, no, I can't. Uh, why don't you look at his book? Oh, didn't know he'd written a book. Wiedemeyer Reports in the mid-50s. Okay. So I got off the phone. I uh, called the local University of New Brunswick Library, which is two miles from my house. <laughs> it's very nice to have that. And I asked if they had the book. They had the book. I went over, borrowed the book. I have privileges at the library. And within half an hour, found three documents that somebody had uh, emulated, is the word I like to use, uh, with very few changes. They changed a the date and a couple of words, so you'd think it was something it wasn't. And I found three documents right off the bat. And a few days later, I went back to the library, grabbed some other books in that same section of the library, and found a bunch more documents where the handwritten material was in exactly the same place on the page. You know, Xerox machines work. In other mm -hmm. words. And so uh, it was clear to me that, and, and some people thought because it was hard to read some of the documents, that meant they were genuine. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so... I uh, became very concerned, and I asked somebody who worked for the CIA, uh, you think it's possible that there were classes where guys in intelligence groups are, have as a class exercise, make up a phony document? You know? Hmm. He said, why not? That's certainly a great question. Yeah. Certainly signatures. People forget when we picked up uh, Eichmann, where was it, Argentina or someplace, when the Israelis picked up Eichmann, one of the people that was with their team, the big Nazi, one of the people that was with their team was a document forger. Oh. I mean, a legal one. <laughs> he worked for the government. Mm -hmm. Well, if you take somebody across boundaries, national boundaries, you got to have paperwork for him. Right. You know, our friend isn't feeling well at all, but here are his documents and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so it was standard practice that you had got to have a document guy around to uh, make documents, phony ones. So, you know, I, I, I understand that there are plenty of people who are good at making phony documents. Doesn't every spy have to have phony documents? Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about it... Uh, he wasn't born in Milwaukee. He was born in Munich. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, regarding the uh, document, um, Bill in the forum had this question. Um, could it be the reaction of the UFO community was exactly the outcome desired by the document's creator, namely just enough earmarks, earmarks of authenticity to gain a certain level of publicity on the content, but with a relatively quick recognition that this is not authentic? Well, I, I think that may very well be, because my feeling in the early mass of documents, there were dozens of them, that <clears throat> good stuff gets out, you put crap on the market, and hope it rubs off on the good stuff. Mm. And I can understand that, that there's a certain utility to that, because it takes a gutsy guy who's done his homework to stand up for something where everybody knows those documents are phony, Stan. Uh, I've had some people say that to me. And I say, the question isn't those documents, sure. A lot of them are phony, 
but what's wrong with these three? You know, mm. show me where the errors are. And uh, one guy gave me a hard time on the Internet. There's no top secret, uh, I want to say, code word uh, document number on top. All, he said all top secret documents have to have that number. And I pointed out that I'd already published a couple that didn't. Yeah. And if you look at a listing of the documents in the Air Force uh, files, uh, intelligence files, uh, there's a whole large record group of them, I quoted the numbers that uh, he said this file includes only top secret numbers, and they all have these uh, top secret documents, and they all have these code numbers on them. And I had to point out, I've got a copy of the listing of all the documents. It's 50 pages long. Uh, and only a small percentage were top secret. Lots of them were just plain old confidential or secret, not top secret code word especially. Hmm. And uh, he, he apologized after a few days uh, that his source of information hadn't been able to provide any justification for this, that, and the other thing. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff about documents, and I think they're important, but it is foolish to say that because you've got a phony one, they're all phony. Hmm. You know, that makes no sense. Uh, hmm. And uh, guys working in the intelligence business know the kind of things to to make look good and make look phony, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a question on uh, the chat room uh, in regard to MJ-12 documents. He said that every, uh, this is uh, RJAA, says every document that he has read um, is about as non-technical as it gets. And I'm an engineer. Do you never see any meat? Do you ever see any meat in any of these documents? Um, does that bother you that it's not technical? Uh, it doesn't bother me because I think that would be in a separate box entirely. Uh, highly technical stuff I can't imagine. Highly technical, legitimate stuff. Uh, I don't think gets out. Those mm -hmm. documents are still classified. We still have loads of documents that are classified from the Truman era, for God's sakes. Uh, you know, because who knows what good it might be for somebody. So I don't expect. I mean, that's the first batch of MJ-12 documents. Uh, you know, I don't know who put them out. I certainly don't know why. Hmm. And I was quite dubious. Uh, like I say, finding the name Menzel on the list. Uh, these guys were ready for us to go public and say, gotcha, I know who faked that one. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I, I'm not surprised that we're not getting... It, it proves that you can keep secrets is what I'm saying, I guess. Mm -hmm. The highly classified technical stuff doesn't get out. Why should it? Yeah. Okay. Cal on the message room um, wants your opinion on the purpose of government's efforts to manipulate UFO conversation. Um, do you consider the prima facie evidence of the phenomena that they cannot outright control? Well, they certainly can't control if a, a, an aircraft stumbles and crashes. <laughs> you know, they, mm -hmm. they, they can't keep that from happening. And they can't keep a big mouth from opening his mouth when he's drunk. Occasionally that happens on things. But I think the government, let's not forget that we have a planet with, I, I don't know what the latest number is, 195 countries, some, some yeah, large number. 195, 196, for, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a planet Earth government. There's nobody who speaks for the planet. You know, why don't they land on a White House lawn? Well... The president does not speak for, uh, what do we got, seven and a half billion people on the planet? Maybe it's nine. I don't know. I haven't kept track. Uh, you know, so what What are we going to do? I lost my track on that. Where I was, give me that question again. Uh, this guy just wanted to know if the government, what you thought about the government's uh, efforts to manipulate the conversation. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the, the thing I was getting at was that uh, if we had an Earthling government, there'd be an awful lot of people losing power, wouldn't they? Hmm. Uh, people in power like to stay in power, has been my observation. <laughs> 
So I think it's very important for the people who run the show that they do everything they can for, to keep people from pushing for a planetary government. Hmm. Now, it may be strange to aliens, you know. What's with these guys? they got a dinky little planet here. We think it's beautiful, and I think it is beautiful, but, uh, you know, what, what, what's with them? Uh, why don't they have a government for the... Look at all the languages on the planet. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes I think that uh, Earth is a penal colony. They dumped all the bad boys and girls here, and that's why they're, we're so nasty to each other. Uh, that could be. <laughs> well, it's, it's, we certainly don't spend a lot of effort trying to make the place better. Like I say, mm-hmm. a trillion dollars every year for things military is a, a sad commentary. Yeah, yeah. And and let's just go way off topic and just let's just say that we were able to start um, occupying the moon or say Mars, another planet. Yeah. How do you think that would go uh, for our species? Do you think it would be a wartime on uh, uh, land grabbing and you know wartime as far as control of another planet? Well, look how uh, we had wars when we people were migrating South America, North America. There were there were wars. Look, I live in Canada. There were the French Indian Wars, you know, mm-hmm. the War of 1812, uh, our own little planet. So I, I think that's going to be a big step. It's not as far in the future as some might think. Mm. Uh, look, I worked on fission and fusion propulsion systems for deep space travel. And most people think nuclear, oh, that's terrible, and blah, 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 blah. We operated, well, Los Alamos operated a nuclear fission rocket less than eight feet in diameter at a power level of 4,400 megawatts. That's twice the power of Hoover Dam. Jeez. The exhaust temperature of the hydrogen, very cold hydrogen going in, very hot going out, was over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. And that was back in the 60s. Unreal. And I worked on a study in 1962 of fusion propulsion for deep space travel. And for the listeners, almost all the energy in the universe is produced by nuclear fusion in the stars. That sun up there isn't a mass of burning gas. It's a fusion system. And uh, the... Well, uh, look, take a little escalation. In 1944, a big bomb was a 10-ton blockbuster least the energy of 10 tons of dynamite. Wow! Mm. And it took a big B-29 to carry it. 1945, first atomic bomb, 16,000 tons of TNT, dynamite uh, energy equivalent. First fusion device, 1952, released the energy of 10 million tons of dynamite. One stinking weapon! Mm. And the Russians dropped their Tsar Bomba it was 57 million tons of TNT energy release equivalent. Now, that means you can go to the stars. Hmm. And, and, you know, that, that's pretty scary on the one hand. It's exciting on the other. Uh, and, well, the other thing that goes with that, of course, our planet's only 4 billion years old. But the uh, hmm. neighborhood is 13 billion years old. So somebody got started a little bit before we did. We didn't figure out that there were even neutrons until 1932. Fission and fusion in 1938. So what if somebody got started a hundred, a thousand, a million years before we did? What do they know that we don't know? Hmm. Um, you know, so we have to take into account that we're, we're Johnny come lately. So. Right. I think we are anyway. <laughs> yeah. Now what do you think about uh, Bob Bigelow's claims... Uh, or his interview on 60 Minutes. Did you catch that? Well, I saw a write-up about it, and as it happens, uh, I got the first research grant that Bob gave for UFO studies. Really? Wow. Way back when. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was very impressed with him. I mean, he, he he's a billionaire, and you can see why. He can make decisions. He knows what he wants, and he goes for it. And uh, he, he was a pleasure to deal with, frankly, because, mm-hmm. you know, give me a budget, and I, I sent him some stuff, faxed him some stuff, and I got a yes back in two days. And, uh, you know, we, we agreed on the terms, the size of the contract. There was a check in my bank account by the mm-hmm. end of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, 
uh, he went with us on on a visit out to the plains of San Augustine. Stayed in the same crummy motel that the rest of us <laughs> did. <laughs> but it, so he he paid for the helicopter though, which made it a heck of a lot easier mm. <laughs> than driving yeah. on the boonies. Yeah, you know. So Bob is a gutsy guy. He knows what he wants. Uh, I appreciate his guts and saying he didn't care. Don't you think you should be careful about what you say? Somebody asked him, and uh, I guess on the program, and I don't care. Yeah, uh, I'm not I love that about too. Anything. Yeah, and if, if more people had the same amount of courage, we'd be a heck of a lot further advanced. But so I, I'm a fan of his, and I acknowledge him, which pleased him. Uh, I didn't ask him about it, but I acknowledged him first, and later he told me he was appreciated in one of my books, mm. uh, Flying Saucers in Science, I think, uh, gave him credit for having provided research money. I mean, it takes money to do research, you know, right. like it or not. Uh, nobody flies me for free. <laughs> well, you know, it's just like he said in that interview, he's spent more money than anyone else on the topic. And uh, I believe that's absolutely the, the you know the truth, and not just that you know I mean Skinwalker Ranch and all that you know yeah. he was involved in all that, and uh, yeah, uh, he's a solid guy. I we've met, we've spent time together, we've had meals together. I appreciate it. I mean, I'm not a billionaire, <laughs> but I do appreciate how he handled things, and I could see why uh, he took definite actions. He didn't monkey around hemming and hawing and so forth. And let me give you a contrast with something. When I was in in industry working on nuclear rockets, I was visiting Erja General uh, in California. I worked for Westinghouse in Pittsburgh and dealing with my radiation shielding guy. And he said, hey, Stan, you want to go to a meeting? What what kind of a meeting? Well, NASA is having a meeting about what they should do with the nuclear rocket. Oh, sure, I'd love to go. I went. It was the worst meeting I ever attended. They hadn't the faintest idea what they wanted to do. Maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. Maybe an Earth orbit, lunar orbit. Maybe a base on the moon. Maybe Mars. They, look, you need an Admiral Rickover who says, that's where we're going, folks. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want to go there? Get off the, uh, the plane. Uh, and I was so disappointed in NASA because in the 60s, most of us in the space program thought we'd have a base on the moon by the by 2000 mm-hmm. we didn't <laughs> you know. yeah well, why so, do you think that is so stalled that is stalled so much and we haven't gone to the moon since 19 what is it 1970 or 72 in, in the early 70s anyway yeah. uh, and a, a failure of what's the word not ambition guts courage or, of course, it's possible that the aliens said, stay the heck off our planet, buddy. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, that was a question earlier in the uh, chat room. Someone wanted to know if you, what you thought about the claims that people say that there's bases on the uh, other side of the, you know, the dark side of the moon or whatever. Well, you know, the, the MUFON conference this year, which is being held in Las Vegas in a couple of weeks, uh, it, the secret space program is the, uh, the oh, yes. motif, uh, yeah. if you will. And I, I, I'm not going to this one. I only go when they pay my way. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been to more than anybody else. I've spoken at more than anybody else. And I'm anxious to see something, but I've seen no evidence. I think some of that claims, uh, there's a guy who claims he goes there every two weeks to Mars, I think. Uh, people forget how big an undertaking it would be. And yes, secrets can be kept, but we're talking huge, enormous amounts of money to, to, to build these systems. Also, if we've developed so much technology like this, why don't we use it? We've had a few wars. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, that's where you normally would use your your top-notch uh, technology, I would think. I would think so, so, too. And that, that kind of brings circle back to the triangle UFOs. That, uh, But keep going, and I'll, I'll bring that up. Well, uh, you know, uh, my my thought is that we may have had systems that we tried and didn't work, and some of you cut the mustard, you know. Mm-hmm. I, and I, I think that's probably happened. Uh, look, re- people forget maybe that there were we had supersonic transports. Can't take a flight now, can you? And 
what caused the stop. It wasn't economically feasible. You know, if, if every flight loses money, uh, it's not a good thing to do mm-hmm. <laughs> if you have a company, uh, trillionaire or not. Uh, so I, I think that there may be all kinds of classified technology around, but I'm not at all satisfied that we have set up bases on the moon yeah. or uh, Mars or any place el- else beyond that. Yeah, I'm not really so feeling I, that either. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm happy to be shown some evidence, but I want evidence, not somebody saying, well, I know somebody who goes there every other week. Uh, that's, that's not good enough. Don't we have a like an orbiter around the moon too, like photo, you know, filming constantly and photographing? We have had uh, what was it, Clementine? I think was up there for a long time, and uh, made observations of water on the moon and, and other places. So I, you know, I can't say it's impossible. What I can say is I have seen no evidence to date that we have a base on the moon or Mars or any place else in the solar system besides Earth. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd be happy if we did. Gee, we're getting up there, you know, I'd say. But, uh, and again, partly because there is a little jurisdictional dispute. Mm-hmm. Is it going to be China that runs it or Russia or the United States or uh, wh- whoever? Who makes the decisions? And uh, we've had a few wars on this planet to uh, settle those questions heavily. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's over 300,000 wars documented or something like that. I read something where I, I may be way off on the number, but th- the amount of wars documented throughout history is just incredible. Yes, and the damage done by those wars. Mm-hmm. And the people the 20th killed century, by those the worst, wars. you know. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and a simple number. World War II... We nice earthlings killed 50 million of our own kind, Mm -hmm. and we destroyed 1,700 cities. Can you imagine 500 airplanes at once going across Europe and all of them dropping bombs? Just Uh, crazy. You know, it's scary. It is, yeah. Yeah. Um, So now getting back to the technology, say that um, there is, you know, some... uh, technology like a triangle or something like that why don't you think they are uh you know there's not talk about something being used that's really advanced in 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 our and our warring that we do i probably the cost mm-hmm. fancy technology is expensive hmm. you know it's not bows and arrows anymore <laughs> yeah they're cheap mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then someone had asked also in the chat room earlier, what did you think about reverse technology of, uh, do you think any of that has ever happened? I think some some of it has happened on occasion. Let me give you one example. Uh, I did a weekly science commentary for the local CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Company station, for six years here in Fredericton, and I was reading on the latest, uh, I've read a lot of papers and stuff. There was one on uh, new developments in per- better permanent magnets, neodymium iron boron, which I, whoever heard of that. But anyway, <laughs> it, it, it buried in this was that the original work on what was previously thought to be the best permanent magnet, uh, samarium cobalt, two other things nobody's heard of, <laughs> um, the work was done at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. I just laughed my head off uh, because th- that's where the wreckage from Roswell went. Hmm. It, there's a foreign technology group there, it's called, and I had a contract with them looking at uh, so whether the Soviets had the capability of building reactors in space, and they did, I concluded. I must have been the only guy in the country that was happy when the uh, Cosmos 954 crashed in, in northern Canada because it was had a nuclear reactor on board, and mm. it was like the 13th one that they had built, and they wound up building the Russians so over 30. The United States has launched one. Mm. Uh, so and, and I, I think 
what I'm saying is I think there has been successful back engineering, if you will, that, uh, you know, and people ask me, well, what would you do if you picked up a wreckage? I'd send pieces off to the best labs I knew that had a appropriate security clearance and appropriate talent. And the first question is, what is this stuff? It's a combination of samarium and cobalt. What would you use those for? Well, that's somebody else's job. And you'd, say, measure all the electrical, uh, magnetic, et cetera, properties. And you'd find the biggest magnetic moment of any material we've ever measured. And you'd go to build that. That doesn't build you a propulsion system, but it builds you some new technology. So you learn what you can when you when you can do it. Hmm. Um, but that's not the same as, you know, it's like handing somebody... If you handed somebody my cheap wristwatch, digital wristwatch, and in the year I was born, 1934, he'd have known it was a watch, he'd known there was a battery in it, but he sure as heck couldn't analyze the chip, and he surely couldn't build another chip. Hmm. Just a cheap wristwatch, but, you know, Intel spends a billion dollars to build it, uh, <laughs> a facility to make more things. So hmm. it isn't easy right. to I deal never thought with of the new... Well, it, it's kind of scary when you look at some of the technology. I used, uh, I hate to say this, I used a slide rule when I started working in industry. <laughs> yeah. I was well, I was in front of a class of students at a university in Michigan. Not one of them knew what a slide <laughs> rule was. <laughs> Nobel Prize winners use slide rules. Now yeah. you, you buy for five bucks, you buy a little solid-state device, and you can do far more for far less once you've gotten to that far from starting from zero. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh boy, I had a question and I didn't write it down. Um, it was it was in regards to once again. To, oh yes, the technology the, the technology that the crafts must have had to get here. How do you think it's possible that they could have crashed? And there's a number of noted well, crashes. You've just made an assumption. I I think we have a two stage system from solar system to solar system and then once you're in the atmosphere for example we have nuclear powered aircraft carriers huge monsters uh, over 800 feet long uh, that can operate for 18 years without refueling right. think about that yeah. for a minute Amazing. Uh, on the other hand they carry about 75 little airplanes that can operate for two hours without refueling <laughs> In other words, between the stars is an entirely different environment huh. from within the atmosphere of a planet. So, I, and we don't see any of these huge motherships near the planet, you know, down uh, on the landing field, so to speak. They're seen up above. There's some great cases, uh, but they're big, and they're up there, not down here. So I think... Uh, we are dealing with two separate problems, interstellar and atmospheric propulsion system, an entirely different environment. A lot cheaper to zip around in the atmosphere. So if that's the case, let's just say there, let's just go to Roswell and say that there was a mothership up there and they launched, you know, the smaller craft which crashed. Why wasn't there a, an attempt to, of a retrieval? We don't know that there wasn't. I mean, the mothership may have moved off there and launched some over and over that place, and you guys look at that quadrant and so forth. Oh, God. In other words, I don't think they launched and it crashed. I think it had been flying around, doing its duties for days, whatever. Uh, and But as it happens, there were plenty more sightings in New Mexico right after the, that period of time, early July, in other words. Mm. Uh but I think, who knows, maybe they only had the, uh, what do you call, uh, clones maybe, you know, uh -huh. the, the working guys. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're expendable. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would think that, uh, <clears throat> you know, just thinking the way a human would think, that we wouldn't want our technology to get in someone else's hands, but, you know, maybe they don't think that way. Well, maybe they think these idiots couldn't duplicate this in 50 years. What do you mean? <laughs> well, they're, and they're right. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't, as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah. I've heard you say before at a lecture that uh, there's been over 5,000 trace cases. 
Yes, Ted Phillips is the expert on that. It's from 80 countries. 80 countries, yeah. What What would you say, um, and, and actually, uh, currently, uh, I've been in touch with uh, Ray Stanford, and he's working on something, um, going oh. back to Socorro, which, uh, um, yeah. you know, hopefully there'll be something out of that. But um, what would you consider one of the, we only have a, five or six or seven minutes here what would you consider one of the best trace cases well i'm still partial because i've been there uh to delphos kansas uh and uh you know the johnson family doing their thing and uh ronnie johnson's out taking care of the sheep and this darn old saucer lands uh, right over there and he's with his dog and shocked to see this thing this goes back a number of years and uh the thing t- takes off and he slowly he dashes into the house tells his parents he just saw this this strange vehicle out there and they go out and they see it and they see the uh, the ring a uh, circle of soil hmm. that was dried out uh and is mother places her hand on the soil and she almost burns herself uh this was weird and ted heard about this and uh, th- there was some publicity in the area in some ways oh the sheriff got involved too. <laughs> yeah. uh and so i got sent samples of the soil from the ring mm-hmm. and from the surrounding area and I had I called a couple of companies. I was living in California at the time. Uh, you know, what's the best lab for checking soil that won't grow anything? Because I didn't get until after some time, and they tried running us plant some seeds. You know, and the ring soil didn't grow anything, and the normal soil grew stuff fine. And I uh, found that the soil had a higher level of soluble minerals. Too salty, if you want to put it that way. You know, mm-hmm. it's very hard to grow uh, under those conditions. So, you know, we've got a family known in the community, small town, Delphos, Kansas, is a quite small town. The sheriff was involved. Uh, I met the people. I trust Ted. He's collected over 4,000, over, well, I don't know what the number is now. I haven't talked to him recently. Uh, he's from Missouri. Uh close by he actually visited the place not too long afterward and so it's a typical case that they didn't see any beings on the ground only about uh i forget under 16 percent of the cases involve reports of beings seen associated with the craft Hmm. but all over the world this happens and sure, nobody brought out a net and captured an alien and showed it off at the local zoo. You know, <laughs> I, I think they might be resistant to that. Uh, once they get stuck <laughs> down here, the food's lousy, you know. <laughs> People are <laughs> they scary. Need food, I yeah. don't know. Mm. But there are loads of such cases, is the point. Thousands, not five or ten. Uh, well, what is missing in this whole picture is... When I, when I, well, to illustrate it, I check my audiences at the end of my lecture, never at the beginning. How many people here believe they've seen what I would consider to be a flying saucer? Uh, I'm not asking names. I'm just, uh, I'll point and count. And uh, when I do this, much to the surprise of many of the people there, 10% of the people in my audiences believe they've seen one. Mm-hmm. But then I ask, uh, how many of you reported what you saw? Right. Ninety percent of the hands go down. Right. If there's still anybody left, I'll say, "How many of you were in the military at the time?" And if there's still anybody left, I say, uh, "You want to tell us about it?" One guy in front of thirteen hundred people in Texas says, "I can't. They told me not to say anything." Wow. <laughs> I had another guy say, uh, "They took my pictures." That's all he said. <laughs> Uh-huh. And I said, well, I'm sure the audience would like to hear the rest of the story. So they brought a microphone over. He didn't, I didn't ask his name. He didn't stand up. Uh, you want to tell us about it? Well, he was flying a four, he was a pilot flying a four engine aircraft over the Pacific. There was another plane 20 miles ahead, radioed back, saucer heading your way. They had gun cameras on the plane. They took pictures. They called the base to which they were flying. 
let them know that intelligence information was coming in. You don't take the film to the drugstore for anybody <laughs> worries about such things. And when they landed, the film got taken, and they were debriefed and told never to say anything. Hmm. And I'll tell you, I, I, I would say everybody in the room believed the guy. He mm -hmm. just came across so well, and it was clear they knew that I hadn't, you know, I wasn't from there at all. This is in Indianapolis, as a matter of fact. Uh, and so how many more cases are there like that where people are afraid to talk in general? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if I had pushed him, well, I'll give you another example. Uh, guy, when I asked, do you want to tell us about it? Uh, I'll talk to you later. Comes up to my table. He wanted to tell somebody, but he, he felt very constrained. The guy tells he's flying a helicopter in Vietnam. And suddenly this sleek, circular, saucer-type vehicle comes by them, circles around them twice, and he figures, we're dead. It must be a new <laughs> Russian vehicle, you know, ah, and took yeah. off. Mm -hmm. So he dutifully, when they land, he reports to the commander uh, about the experience they'd had. And the next day, base commander, Lieutenant Jones, uh, you didn't see anything strange yesterday, did you? Yes, sir, I reported it. You didn't hear me, Lieutenant Jones. Uh, you didn't see anything strange yesterday, did you? No, sir. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, how many times more has that happened? So uh, until we break through that laughter curtain and the fear curtain, the security curtain, yeah. the good stuff is going to be out there. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, Stan, we're at the end of the show. Can you give out your website address, please? Yeah, the, the easiest way to reach me, www.stantonfriedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, dot com. And it lists all my books. And I should add, one thing you can't get from Amazon, they're a great place to buy books, but you don't get my autograph. That's right. Everything I send out, I autograph. Yeah. So it lists all my books. There's some articles, there's stuff to find out. But there's plenty of, it also gives me a funds address and all that sort of stuff. So there. There is an opportunity, and I should say one thing. We've changed our view about how many planets there are. Frank Drake was saying there might be 8,000 places that could send signals in our galaxy. The current number would be, well, 8 billion. <laughs> you know, so our <laughs> perception a has changed. Yeah. Yeah, just a little. <laughs> the equation has so changed. Yeah. Yes. All right. Hey, thanks, Stan. It's always a real pleasure to have you on. And uh, until next time. I look forward to it. All right, Maybe you take we'll care. have more new news. <laughs> I hope so. All right. You take care. You too. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Bye-bye.